Welcome everybody to our second national call in 2020. Um, good evening to you all. It, I'm Jerry Friedman, co-chair of Elders Climate Action, and I want to just welcome you tonight to the call. It's going to be um, exciting and interesting, so stay tuned. Uh, before we get started, I just want to give you a little bit of the mechanics of the call. We, if you hover across the bottom of your screen, you'll see a box that says Q&A, and if you have any questions, um, that you want answered, we'll have a Q&A time at the end of Peterson's talk. It, just put those questions in the Q&A box and we will get to them um, at the end of the conversation. And also we have a chat box, which is not really for our, for our questions, but if you have something you want to share with others, um, and also uh, we will be dropping some links in there for you uh, to, to to kind of connect with um, that Peterson is going to provide for us. So um, while we're on the call, everybody will be muted, but you have the opportunity to clearly have um, time for questions at the end of the call. And now I would like to introduce you to Frances Stewart, who's one of our Eldest Climate Action leaders, and she's going to introduce Peterson. So to you, Thanks, Jerry. Um, really excited about having Peterson here tonight. Um, I think all of us have noticed that a lot of the things we're hearing about climate change attend toward the dark and depressing side. And sometimes it's hard to really have a lot of hope and to want to press forward in the ways that we need to do. Um, and then we're told we need to really engage people in conversations about climate change. And sometimes that seems somewhere between difficult and impossible. Um, so I think we have the perfect speaker tonight. Um, I first heard Peterson at a Citizens Climate Lobby Conference uh, a little over a year ago and was intrigued uh, by his background and about um, his approach to these issues. Um, Peterson uh, is one of the most versatile people I know. He's a performance artist, a climate communications trainer, a Bible scholar, a radio producer, and a filmmaker. Uh, since 2003, he's used comedy and storytelling to help audiences understand difficult and polarizing issues like LGBTQ rights and debates about faith and sexuality. You know, for the past several years, he's brought uh, that background and those talents to helping people engage in deeper conversations about climate change. Um, one of the things that uh, he does that I think particularly impressed by is he's a host of Citizens Climate Radio. It was a podcast I had never run into until I heard Peterson speak. And now I'm a devoted listener. I hope you all will become devoted listeners too. Um, so I'd like to turn this over to Peterson. Well, thank you, Francis. Thank you all of you for, for joining us tonight uh, for this webinar. I'm coming to you from rural central Pennsylvania. And it's a very special day here in rural central Pennsylvania because while in some places they celebrate Mardi Gras or Fat Tuesday, we have Donut Day where the Amish take all of their naughtiness that they've been abstaining from, they mix it with uh, flour and sugar and, and deep fry it and they make donuts. And I just would be remiss if, if I started without offering you um, some donuts from the Weaver sisters. So help yourself, take what you want. <laughs> um, I'm really thrilled to be here. My presentation, I hope, will be, um, you'll walk away with some real practical information with some new resources. I, now, I know many of you are, have been doing climate work for some time, so some things you'll hear might be a repetition, it might be a reminder of some things that you once knew, but hopefully you'll hear some, some from fresh information. For me, I think it's important whenever we do climate work, we come as our whole selves and that we don't fit into anybody's box of what a climate advocate is. And uh, I'm going to tell you just a little bit of my backstory because I think it's important uh, to understand kind of the nature of my work and, uh, and to model for you a little bit of climate storytelling. Um, and the first thing I want to tell you is that um, I'm very concerned about climate change but I'm not an environmentalist and I've never been an environmentalist. I mean, I'm not against environmentalists. I mean, some of my best friends are environmentalists, but um, 
I say that because not everyone is in this for the same reason. We can care about the same thing for different reasons. And I have many very compelling reasons to be concerned about climate change, but very little of them have to do with nature or animals. Again, not that I don't care about those things, but they're not on my top priority. Uh, and so let me jump into my story and I'll make a little sense. So I come from a, an Italian American working class background. My family is from New York City and I grew up in the Catskills in upstate New York. And, and that identity is like very central and we were never environmentalist in my family either. So it was sort of a foreign thing. Uh, in, in my own personal life, I um, became a performance artist and a public speaker because of a strange conflict in my own life in that I'm a Christian and my faith is incredibly important to me, but I'm also gay. And growing up, those things didn't seem to fit well together. Uh, and so for many years, I tried to get rid of the gay thing because it was just getting in the way of the Christian thing. Uh, and I attempted to de-gay myself through conversion therapy. I actually spent 17 years and over $30,000 on three continents attempting and utterly failing to de-gay myself. And I really denied reality that I was gay. So I sort of have a hot, hot, uh, you know, I sort of have a soft spot for people who are in denial about climate change because Lord knows I was in denial for a long time about who I was. And I recognize that, you know, fear, when we feel fear, we feel shame. That sort of help, makes it hard for us to get out of those places of denial. But I finally did um, come out and came to my senses. And I realized that a lot of people didn't know about conversion therapy. Uh, and, and how dangerous it was and how much harm it caused uh, the, those of us who were part of it. So I began to speak out and, and, and I'm actually quite shy, which any of you who are, are uh, doing climate work and you worry because you're shy, don't worry, there's, there's spots for shy people. But I'm, I'm shy and even though I speak in front of people, when I first stood up in front of people, I couldn't do it as myself. I had to do it in character and, and since I'm a character actor, it was great, so my first play was about my experiences of trying to de-gay myself. It's called Doing Time in the Homo Nomo Halfway House. It was a 90 minute comedy where I played eight characters and unpacked this story. And I came upon a very, very helpful formula that works very well for me in talking about difficult contentious issues that often get shut down in conversation. And that was to figure out a way of telling stories, using some comedy and being vulnerable and, and being personally vulnerable, that risk, that stake of stepping up. Because if I am vulnerable, I then give my listener permission to be vulnerable. They feel safer with me. And so it's a very key thing in my climate work as it was with my LGBT work to, to be vulnerable. And that's when I see the walls come down. And in my case, I, I, I can draw on comedy. Now, it's not natural for everyone, uh, but for me, um, it has been. And, and that has helped so much to diffuse a lot of tension and to um, shed light. Comedy, of course, can make light of, of issues, but it also can shed light. And the combination of getting people to, to laugh and then to think and feel deeply is very, it's a very powerful combination. And I've been able to tap into that with my work. So I was going contentedly along in life. I've been for full time traveling as a performance artist, a speaker, a Bible scholar. Um, I'm one of the world's experts on gender non-conforming Bible characters and eunuchs. So I'd be going to seminaries all over the United States and Europe and Canada, just living my life, having a good time, doing all this until 2012. And that's when I came home to find my husband, Glenn, weeping in the bedroom. Glenn is not a weeper, okay? I'm the weeper in the family. We have a very clear division of labor, okay? I weep, he comforts, it works out beautifully. I'm sure some of you have similar arrangements in your own homes. So this was disconcerting, seeing Glenn not just weeping, he was actually sobbing on the bed. Glenn is originally from South Africa and his uh, family's still there. So I immediately thought of family because at that time in my life, my dad, Pete Toscano was sick and was dying of lung cancer. So I immediately thought, oh no, Glenn heard bad news from back home. I go over, I say, Glenn, what's, what's the matter? What's going on? And through the sobs, 
he points to an article that he was reading and he says, it's about climate change. And I was like, uh, when, you know, like I was, I was like confused because I don't ever remember us ever talking about climate change. Not that we ever denied it. It was just not part of our everyday conversation. I said, well, what about climate change? He said, well, new science has been released. It's, it's worse than they imagined. It's happening faster than they feared. And, uh, and he started having this breakdown. Now, something you need to know about Glenn, when he was a college student, this was right before Nelson Mandela was released. Uh, he was part of the anti-apartheid struggle and part of the queer liberation movement in South Africa. So he understands that there are sometimes issues come up in life where we have to just stop what we're doing and get involved, get engaged. And he was feeling this about climate change. Like this is not just an everyday issue. And he was saying like, how can I teach creative writing at a university when this is going on? Maybe I need to go in a whole new direction. Being unaccustomed to comforting, I did the best I could. I was like, there, there, it'll be okay or not. We'll research, we'll join a group. I mean, what do you say? What do you say when the person you love is, is losing it over something that you've not even spent hardly any time thinking about? Glenn is extraordinary at doing research uh, and it helps very much when we go on vacation because he provides a whole dossier of things that we can do. But he used these superpowers to begin to research climate change and what can people do about climate change beyond just sort of decarbonizing our house as much as possible. And he said, you know, after weeks, he said, you know, one of the most powerful things that we can do is see about putting a price on carbon and then giving that money back to households. And I found a group that I've signed you up for and I signed myself up for, it's called Citizens Climate Lobby. I said, it sounds kind of boring and effective. Okay, fine. Now, all this time, I was not really in yet. Okay, Glenn was in, he was concerned, he was passionate. And I was there kind of in my head, I knew it was serious and all that, but it didn't hit my heart and it didn't hit my gut. And climate change, I'm sure some of you know this already, it's not enough just to be in our head. It hits our heart and the things that we love and care about. It hits, it hits our gut, that place of our, our deepest identity, our deepest needs. And so it hadn't done that yet. Glenn was sending me articles uh, and uh, I would read them uh, and uh, they, you know, again, kept hitting my head. But then one day there was this article that shot right through my heart and deep into my gut. It was an article about drought. It was very technical at first, talking about how on a warmer planet, there's going to be more drought because more moisture is held up in the atmosphere. And then when it does come down, it will come down in a deluge. So you can have a place that in the same year, they have a drought and a flood. But as a result of all this drought, it was gonna to lead to crop disruptions, malnutrition and starvation, local and mass migration, political instability, war. I mean, things that we actually were already seeing in the world. This is when things were blowing up in Syria. Now this started hitting my heart because in my heart, it's about rights and, and human rights and social justice. I was like, wait, this isn't polar bears. This isn't, uh, you know, ice flows or whatever. This is like, these are people, I care about people. And I'm reading the article and then the last line shot right through my gut. It said on a warmer planet, there will be crop failures, including potential failure of wheat production, leading to a global shortage of pasta products. I was like, wait, what? Wait, pasta is an endangered species? I mean, I'm Italian American, okay? Pasta is like the center of our lives. When you are happy and celebrating, you have pasta. When you're sad and mourning, you have pasta. If it's Wednesday, you have pasta, you just have pasta. And to think that something that was so central to my identity, to my culture was suddenly at risk, it shot right through me. And I wish I weren't so shallow. I really wish that it was all this other stuff that really got me, but that was the thing that really, really caught my attention. And lucky for me and, and this work, you know, attached to that string of spaghetti are a whole host of other issues. And that's what pulled me into the climate world so strongly, in fact, that it was shortly after that, my, my dad had passed away, sadly, and he left me a little bit of money uh, and I thought, this is special money. 
this isn't just to be spent on anything. I want to invest this in climate change. So I took a year off to study climate science because I knew nothing and to study what people, how people are communicating science uh, and in climate change and what's working, what's not working. And I spent a whole year doing that in the year 2013 to 2014. And then at the People's Climate March, which I bet some of you were at in various places, I was at the big one in New York. That was my, um, that was my climate change coming out day. I thought of it as a kind of a, a climate pride day uh, you know, for me uh, and, uh, and other people. But, and, and, and that was like sort of when I marked it, I, I uh, launched a website called Climate Stew and a podcast called Climate Stew. And, and it was from there I, I realized that all those tools that I had learned about using comedy, personal storytelling, that needs to be woven into the work that I'm doing. Now, the first thing I noticed when I started doing um, my climate work was um, how much people were talking about climate denial. In fact, when people heard I did comedy, the first thing they said was, oh my gosh, you've got so much fodder. And I thought, no, instinctively I knew as a comic that um, making fun of climate deniers was a mistake. For one, that's what everybody else was doing. Uh, so it wasn't very original. Uh, and it seemed dehumanizing. Uh, and I, was, uh, I, I wasn't gonna go there. I, I understood why people were frustrated and angry with people who were skeptical, but I thought I wanna push myself and do other kinds of comedy. But I realized something when I listened to people give climate talks that I could tell that our brains were hacked by climate denial because almost every climate presentation I saw always had a section that I just thought of as the section entitled, look, see, it's really happening. And they would spend time, sometimes a significant amount of time, talking about the impacts of climate change because they felt they needed to convince someone in the room that it was real. And I said to myself, that is sapping away our time and our creativity. So I want to live in my brain as if there were no climate denial and say, if there were no climate denial, what would we be talking about? And that has helped me so much because um, I don't get bogged down with all the impacts of climate change, which is what often gets people feeling so gloomy. Um, but instead, it's given me a chance to begin to question what else can we talk about. So here's the good news. There was obviously a period of great climate denial that was um, funded and orchestrated. It has been always much stronger in the US than anywhere else in the world. And it's because people were lied to and they were deceived. The good news is that is rapidly changing uh, and has rapidly changed and we don't have to talk about the impacts of climate change anymore because climate change is speaking for itself. So I want to show you a short video. It's a one minute video. It's a promo for one of my episodes of Citizens Climate Radio. It was one of my favorites because I got to sit down and chat with, uh, with Dr. and Catherine Hayhoe and I was like geeking out fanboy the whole time. I like, it was really hard to, to be responsible and ask good questions, but I did. And, uh, and I put together this little one minute clip and, and it's very exciting what she shows in it because she reveals that we don't need to be so worried about talking about the impacts of climate change because that is already being done for us. So let me go to enter fill screen and here we go. One of the biggest myths that we've bought into when it comes to a changing climate is the myth that it doesn't matter to me. And for a long time, we climate scientists had to address this through showing what was going to change in the places where we live. But today, we don't have to do that anymore. We can talk about what is actually happening today. And that is the greatest strength of the U.S. National Climate Assessment, which was just released recently, because it brings this down to the local level where we live. The fact that in many northeast cities along the coast, high tide flooding has increased by a factor of 10 over the last 50 years, or that wildfire is now burning twice the area in the western U.S. than it would if it weren't for a changing climate, or the fact that Hurricane Harvey, almost 40% of the rainfall associated with that record-breaking storm, would not have occurred if the same storm had happened 100 years ago. We can now connect the dots directly between people's personal experience and why a changing climate matters. So, let me go back to you. Where am I? Zoom. I've lost my Zoom. Oh, stop, sure. There we go. 
All right, I'm back. Um, this is really this is really good news, and I and I've I've been seeing it more and more, and I go to many parts of the of the country, uh, and in speaking with um, uh, Lisa uh, Van Susteren, who is um, a psychi a psychologist, a psychiatrist, and she really looks at the psychological effects of climate change. She says everyone's living with a well of anxiety. They know. Uh, maybe that knowledge hasn't fully hit their head, but in their heart and gut, they know. Um, what they don't know, they don't know what to do about it often. And also what they don't know is they don't have a good, clear vision of what the future is. And this was another thing I, I really pushed myself on during that year. I thought, okay, how are people speaking about the future? And it was almost always apocalyptic and dire. And I thought, it doesn't take a great deal of imagination to think that everything's going to go to hell in a handbasket. It just doesn't really take that much imagination. What takes a lot of imagination is to imagine success, not utopia. Again, utopia is fairly simple to imagine where everything somehow magically is beautiful. But what does success look like, where we actually decarbonize the economy, we begin to work together as communities, as nations, to respond to the effects of climate change, to adapt, to be resilient. What does that look like? So I created a character uh, who is, a, um, who is a, a science historian, a climate history specialist, but I did it in the year 2165, about 150 years in the future. And I wrote 50 monologues entitled That Day in Climate History, where this person looked back over time to chronicle all the amazing accomplishments of the climate generation, people who were active in the world from around 2015 to 2035. Uh, and it was brilliant because I was able to take some existing things that were happening and then imagining, well, where does it go from here? What does success look like? And that was a really helpful thing. Uh, and I started this again in 2014, 2015, to help people begin to imagine a different future. For Citizens Climate Radio, I get to talk to some of the most amazing people and I learn so much every episode. And not too long ago, I had some folks on from a group called Noki, which is not an Italian dish. It sounds like it, but it's not. It's the National Network of Climate Change Interpreters. These are the people who train zoo professionals, aquariums, and folks at museums and national parks. They train them on how to talk about climate change. They received a massive multi-million dollar grant to do a ton of research about what works and what doesn't work. And in talking to them, I had uh, Blair Balzerick on, who also is a, a podcaster. She does um, This Week in Science. I don't know if you've ever heard that, that podcast. But she said some things in this particular episode that changed the way I talk about climate change. And I was able to capture it in a one minute clip. And I want you to watch this very, very closely, what she's saying about what will move people to action. So I'm going to go back to the magic of sharing. Mm -hmm. Getting better at this. There's Blair. There's this idea that sex sells, fear sells, all this kind of stuff. And that's true when you talk about things like driving clicks or driving money. A lot of the time, fear is the thing that sells in the very short term, which is why in fundraising, you see a lot of tactics of crisis imaging and this word about the climate crisis. This is very common. But what we found through social science research and the thing that I have really found is that hope is a lasting influence that permeates from just five minutes to an hour to days to weeks to months to years. I think this is the thing that keeps me going personally. It's really important to realize that this future without fossil fuels is kind of an amazing one. It's, it's a cool place. And I think that we need to celebrate what we are trying to create here and paint that picture for people. You know, that's the world I want to be in. That's the world I want for my friends, for my daughter. This is, this is a cool world. Uh, that, uh, Sean Dague, who came on at the end, he led us uh, on in an exercise where we literally would imagine what does a world feel like, smell like, sound like uh, when we're not using fossil fuels. 
fuels for energy. And it's an extraordinary experiment to do, a thought experiment. And, and this is the thing that I, I've learned from Blair and the folks at Noki is that we need to stop talking about the impacts of climate change. And if we do talk about one impact and how it affects people locally, like in your region, and if, if you feel like you need to, but don't do the laundry list because that overwhelms everyone, including you. Instead, we need to begin to talk about the impacts of our solutions. When we act on climate change, how does this change the world? And with Citizens Climate Radio, uh, Citizens Climate Radio, I get to do this a lot. And in my own local Citizens Climate Lobby chapter, I just had us talk about this. We at Citizens Climate Lobby, we're really looking to put a, a price on carbon and then have that money go back to household. It's a carbon fee and dividend. I know there's some folks here who are part of CCL. And there's a bill in play right now. It's the Energy and Innovation and Carbon Dividend uh, uh, Act. And the, 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 the bill, you know, there's a couple different carbon pricing bills, but that's one out there. So the activity I had my folks do in my chapter was um, list off as much as they can the benefits, the immediate, the middle term and the long term benefits of putting a price on carbon and therefore decarbonizing our economy. And I said, think outside the box. Yes, you can think about nature and you can think about rolling back or addressing some of the effects of climate change, but think about economics, think about world peace, think about other things. And people came up with a stunning list. I'll give you one, one example and I'll put it in the form of a story. The very first memory I have as a child, I was um, absolutely terrified. I was, um, I was confused. I had no idea where I was and I couldn't breathe. I had woken up in a plastic oxygen tent in a hospital in Stanford, Connecticut, because I had yet another asthma attack. I was chronically sick with asthma. And back in those days, parents were not allowed to be with a child the whole time when they were there. So my mom was terrified because she couldn't be with me. I was with strangers. I had no idea what was going on. I think I was three or four years old. And the problem was I lived in a neighborhood with lots of pollution. In fact, uh, in my school, I was the only white student in the school. Everybody else was African-American and virtually everybody had asthma in my class. Well, the following summer, my grandparents had moved up to the Catskills. My grandfather retired and my mom took me and my two sisters up there for a month. Uh, and, um, and when we got back, the, my doctor was actually very upset because I used to go for a weekly shot uh, to help me with asthma and with allergies. And he was, you know, he almost called Child Protective Services on my mom until he saw the difference that I had color in my face, that for the first time I was able to put on some weight, I wasn't wheezing. And he said, what did you do? And she said, we, we went to the country, <laughs> we moved. And I think we have to move for good because this neighborhood's killing my kid. And we were fortunate. We had um, the means to move, although my, my father really struggled financially. He, he was a welder and uh, a carpenter, but he only could find seasonal work when we moved. So it was, you know, it was a very difficult time for them, but we moved and we found a community that welcomed us. And that's not true of everyone. Um, a lot of people of color, per, for instance, have a hard time moving out of predominantly black neighborhoods, Latino neighborhoods, because they're not welcome even today in, in, in other neighborhoods. But we were fortunate. But what I'm excited about of, the, of, of putting a price on carbon and of this, this bill, if we could pass it, is that there are so many young people who can just stay in the city and they won't be sick. They won't be missing school. Their parents won't have to stay home to take care of them. People who are adults won't be missing work because of asthma, there'll be much more productivity. And the city will be a place where you can take a deep breath and you don't have dirty city smell of all that fumes. And instead it's a clear, healthy environment for people to, to live and to grow and to prosper. And that's why I'm in this fight for climate change because that's the world I want. And you know what, even if climate change wasn't an issue, that's worth fighting for. 
and so that that's sort of a model of like how to do that because um, my husband Glenn learned this when he was in the anti-apartheid struggle no matter how dire things got and it got very dire at times they would have these rallies where they would you know talk about what needs to be done they would do lots of organizing but always somebody came up at the end whose task it was to motivate people and the speech was very similar every time where the person would stand up and say when we win in the new South Africa, this is what our lives are going to be like. In the new South Africa, we'll be able to move freely and people won't stop us and ask us questions. In the new South Africa, and they would just list off the many things and people would get so excited because they had something to fight for. And that is one of our jobs as climate advocates, to give people excitement about what to fight for, to get excited about what will happen once we do these things. It's inevitable that we're going to make these changes. The question is when and how quickly. And the more excited we can get people about it, I believe the quicker we will build the political will to make it happen. The last two things I want to say before we get to Q&A. I speak to lots of people about climate change, lots of young people, and there are two big issues with climate change I'm sure you talk about all the time. One is mitigation. That means reducing, ending fossil fuel pollution, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions. That's the mitigation. And that comes, you know, sometimes people talk about their personal carbon footprints, but we need to do larger systems things like put a price on carbon, have other sources of energy. I have found that conversation is really hard to have with people because people are so frustrated by this dysfunctional government that we have. And they, um, they just think, well, this isn't a fight that I'm worth getting involved in because it seems hopeless. And fortunately, there are those of us that are, you know, believe in the legislative process and, and you know, we're, we don't feel hopeless, we're pressing through. But a lot of people, that's just overwhelming. But there's this other thing, and I have found people get very, very engaged and excited about it. And it's about talking about adaptation and resiliency. Because the reality is, no matter how well we reduce our fossil fuel emissions, climate change is here. We do feel the effects and we're going to feel the effects. It is already affecting all of our lives and will more. People will be dislocated uh, for a short time or for a long time. And there is so much that we can do right now. So for me, I'm gay and so I have a soft spot for my people, the LGBTQ people. And it's, it's not always known, but um, LGBTQ senior citizens are, uh, have a much harder time in the world than non-LGBTQ citizens. And in part, it's because they've lived with a life of discrimination. Uh, they may be estranged from their family. They may be estranged from their own children if they had children from an earlier marriage. So they're more isolated as older people. They often have far less um, income as well in retirement savings because much of their life they were underemployed or unemployed or they may have had a long-term partner uh, who died but they never got any benefits from that because they weren't legally married. This was, was true for so many years until very recently. They're also very reticent to go into retirement communities when they need to. And it's for a good reason, because they fear that they're gonna to have to go back in the closet because retirement communities are often run by religious groups. Uh, they're often more conservative, older people. And they suddenly are at this point in their life when they're becoming more vulnerable, putting their lives in the hands of people who may hate them and hate their bodies. And so they often hold off and live alone. And so without people always checking in on them, not children checking in on them and all, they're more isolated. And the question I have is what happens when the heat waves come? And if it's over 95 degrees, it becomes deadly for the oldest and the youngest people. And the only real solution is to get into a cool place, but it's very expensive to run AC 24 seven, particularly if you're on a very limited budget. So to me, I, everywhere I go, I mention this, and I say to the young LGBTQ people in the audience, I say, I think it would be a brilliant thing for us to canvas this community and find out where all the LGBTQ seniors are, make a list, and check in with them before, during, and after extreme weather events. 
if nothing else, it's a wonderful intergenerational connection to have. You can help them with other things. They can probably teach you a lot of things, um, but it also builds community. And so anything that we can do to build community obviously is gonna help us with addressing climate change. And I say that because as we're working on big national and international efforts, it's for our own good and for our own community's good to work on some local things. And, and I often say, whatever your passion is, it's probably affected by climate change. So what can you do to protect that? The most popular presentation I do is about pets and climate change and how climate change affects pets and how we can protect them. So for instance, when we have to evacuate from our homes, we usually can't take our pets with us. So up to 40 to 50% of people don't evacuate because that's part of the family. But many communities do have emergency pet shelters. It's just people don't know about them. They're underfunded, understaffed. But that is something you can find out right now. You can even Google it while I'm talking to you. You probably are. Where is the local pet shelter? Do they need money? Do they need volunteers? Do they need donations? Immediately you are engaging in climate work and that helps people because action is an antidote to despair. And I will end with a monologue because I am a performance artist and I think you should have a sample of this. And now uh, after I uh, started doing my climate work, I uh, created this monologue to try to capture the different phases I went through because any of us know this climate work, we don't just like say climate change is serious and then like we'll go for it. We often go through different stages. So these are the five stages of hot climate action. And since I'm a character actor, I've assigned a different character to diff diff each stage. So the first stage is the freak out stage. That's when the penny drops and you realize how serious it is. And for some reason, the freak out stage sounds a lot like my dad, Pete Toscano. Holy guacamole, global warming is going to crush us. Drought, flood, pestilence, whatever that is. From the redwood forest to the Goldstream water, we're going to hell in a handbasket. After freaking out for a time, the pendulum swung the other way and I toyed with denial. I, I didn't come right out and deny climate change, but I was tempted. Uh, well, yes, of course, climate change it is serious, but perhaps it will not be a catastrophe. I mean, Siberia actually could use a little bit of warming. We don't know everything yet. They still may invent something. Uh, this could just be another Y2K. Remember Y2K and how we freaked out about that one? But I couldn't deny reality. And then something horrible happened. I began to feel guilty and ashamed because I realized I was part of the problem. I am emitting greenhouse gases in my home all the time. So then I began a personal purge to purge my life of all greenhouse gases and fossil fuels. So I changed all my light bulbs. I bought those really super expensive, efficient light bulbs. Then I stopped drying my clothes in the dryer, partly because I couldn't afford to after all those light bulbs. Uh, and then when this radical vegan activist with really bad breath screamed at me, I became a vegetarian for about a month, but then it hit me, the despair when I realized that our individual efforts all added up still is not nearly enough. And uh, this is what that sounded like. But what difference does it make? I purged myself dry. No one seems to care. And even if they did lower their own personal carbon footprints in the sand, it's like a teardrop in the ocean which is quickly acidifying. Uh, the very roads they build for us, the entire infrastructure, it is soaked in fossil fuels. It's like the trials of Job, just curse God and die. I don't know why, but my despair voice sounds downright biblical. But then something happened. I began to meet like-minded people who were concerned but who were engaged in action. People like you who are doing something. And I began to experience hope and determination. We live in extraordinary times. So much danger, uncertainty, and fear. But this is not our first rodeo. Our ancestors faced myriad challenges together. The Great Depression, World War II, the HIV AIDS crisis. They learned a lesson that we are discovering today. 
we are not alone. We have each other to encourage each other, to comfort each other, to bind our voices together. And together, dear friends, we shall do the extraordinary. Thank you so much. And we have time for, for questions. And I believe uh, they will be somehow, it will happen. I'm just going to stand here and wait and drink water. Hopefully we won't have to wait too long. We've got several questions. Uh, one is, you've touched our hearts and minds and pointed out we can focus on what we're fighting against uh, rather than for. Uh, how do we make this transition in language? Great question. Great question. One is about being aware, right? You're becoming much more self-aware and, and listening to what you're saying and also seeing the effect on people. I, I mean, you know what it's like when you're talking about climate change and you see they're shutting down and they're not shutting down because they are resistant to the idea. They're just overwhelmed. Uh, and, and so it is about being sensitive to your audience. And I think, um, I think part of it is spend a little time and write out for yourself the, the things that you're personally excited about that will be different in the world as we address climate change. Uh, and it could be on all levels, world peace, there's things a lot you can talk about with world peace uh, with climate change and justice and, uh, and the economy and, and public health and all sorts of things. I think if one of the first things is to figure out why you're personally excited and what does that have to do with your own personal story? Like with my case, it was asthma, because I know what it's like to suffer like that. I know what it's like to have to move from your community that you love. Find out where you connect with that thing and then figure out like, why are you excited about it? And paint that beautiful, clear picture of what that looks like. And when you see yourself and it's so easy to do, getting caught up with the listing of like, and then this is happening, and this is happening, and this is happening. See what's happening to you and how you're feeling. Stop and, and, and begin to think about, but I'm excited because as we act on climate change, the world is actually gonna become a better place. And then begin to see that and speak about that. It's great, thank you. So uh, would you please say more about the bill to put a price on carbon? Yeah, the bill to put a price on carbon. Yeah, um, what I love about uh, the Citizens Climate Lobby proposal, um, which is now a bill is very similar to that, it um, is both highly effective. Uh, it uh, is a very effective way of getting people to, getting companies to reduce carbon emissions as well as individuals, but it's also very just, and this is how it works. The idea is you put a price on carbon at the point of extraction. So if you're gonna take it out of the ground, you have to pay so much per ton, and I believe it's $15 per ton the first year, and every year it goes up another $10. This immediately sends a signal. This is, this is not um, you know, some presidential, uh, you know, things saying we're going to do this. This is law. And so once that becomes law, it sends a signal that fossil fuels are going to be more and more expensive. Therefore, it's not worth investing in. You don't have to get people to, you know, disinvest from these things. And it, they'll immediately do it and they'll say, okay, there's a whole other way of going. Uh, it gives these fossil fuel companies that they know what the projection is and all these patents they're sitting on, they can begin to release about electric cars and all these things. It also signals to business and to government that relying on fossil fuels is going to be very expensive and they have the means to transition very quickly. We saw this with light bulbs when we changed to the more expensive light bulbs for the individual household, they're like, these are too expensive. Businesses changed almost overnight because they did the cost analysis and they just transformed and we will see a very quick shift. There is a problem though, if you put a price on carbon at the point of extraction, that cost will be passed along and the cost of everything will go up, transportation, food, heating, everything. And who suffers then? But the poor, the working class, which is not right. I mean, we should not have solutions that are gonna make people's lives worse. So the idea then is to take the money that's collected don't keep it in the government, don't make the government bigger, but give it to households, distribute it every month as a dividend check for households. 
And, uh, and there's been all this cost analysis about it, how most poorer families will actually come out ahead. And sure, they can continue to pay for fossil fuels at increasing higher rates, but what will happen is uh, you'll see this jostling in the market for people who are looking to produce goods that have a low, lower carbon footprint, so therefore they'll be cheaper and there'll be all these new products and new alternatives available to people. So it seems like a very, almost pretty much every economist in the world says this is the, the mechanism, putting a price on carbon is, is the most powerful thing to change our behavior as a culture, as a society. Um, but it's also very just because it, it doesn't uh, hammer people um, and, and punish them because of these changes. We've got one question who says that she, or he grew up in the Catskills and wanted to know where you grew up. I grew up in a little town called Lake Huntington in Sullivan County, and my parents had a, a very popular restaurant there called Pete's Pub. My father couldn't get work, so they finally bought a business uh, and turned it into a restaurant. Oh, great. So uh, another person is asking about uh, whether or not Glenn is uh, involved in fighting climate change. He, um, you know, he, it's so interesting because he was the one that was first like on board and here I am, like I work for Cl Citizens Climate Lobby now by producing the monthly podcast and I'm speaking about it almost exclusively. And he has, he was writing a novel at the time uh, about South African history and he desperately tried to weave climate change into it. His first draft had all these things and it wasn't working. I mean, at all. And, and on my Citizens Climate Radio, I talk to artists all the time who are doing all sorts of art about climate change. And it is not easy to do good art around climate change. I mean, sure, you can take a graph and kind of make it look artsy, but it's not really artful. Uh, and, uh, and he had to cut that whole narrative out because it was so not working. Mm -hmm. uh, but what he does is he writes a lot of uh, articles and op-eds uh, about climate change. And he's still involved with Citizens Climate Lobby. He lobbies every year around that. And he, and he trains other people about how to do that. And he gives me incredible moral support with what I do and, um, and gives me a lot of really helpful feedback. Oh, great. So what would you say are your biggest landmines with audiences? Say that one more time. What would you say are your biggest landmines with audiences? Um, you you may be surprised. I, I have traveled all over the United States in some very conservative parts of the world and the country. And I've never, one of the landmines I never run into is climate skeptics. I walk in the room, I assume nobody is skeptical, skeptical about climate change. And I never talk about climate science because you do not need to talk about climate science to talk about climate change. It's very basic science you need to know. Uh, there's other things, and in particular, the, the data of how this affects you and how it affects the things you love. And I have never, in, all, in, in like literally since 2015, speaking all over the place, I have never had a problem with someone challenging me, a climate skeptic doing that. What I find the landmine is, are the hope deniers. Mm -hmm. These are the people who believe we've gone too far they are so overwhelmed and so um, jaded by what they see in government and, and all, they're so angry that they're stuck. And anytime you try to talk about solutions or whatever, it, it's almost impenetrable. Uh, and, uh, and I have a lot of empathy for them and I get very frustrated with them because the thing is, if you think like, well, there's nothing we can do, well, that's exactly what you end up doing, nothing. And, um, you know, and, and, and so that's, that's usually the, the hardest uh, group to, to reach because they, you know, they feel like, oh, we've done it all, it's not gonna work. And that's where the comedy can help um, because it relaxes people, it opens them up, it can kind of uh, wedge in those places. And if you're not good at comedy, if that's not your thing, well, good news, I've got a bunch of videos on YouTube. You can just show one of them and uh, say, I'm gonna show you something funny. And that could you know, help balance it out for you. Uh, but that, that, is the, that is, I think, the hardest, those people who are feeling hopeless. And, and, uh, and, I, and I think, you know, one of the things is, to be honest, I don't always feel hopeful. I don't have control over my feelings, but, but this is not about how I feel. It's about um, a choice to be determined. I am determined that, to do something. And even if I fail, even if we fail, um, 
there's no there's no other choice. We need we need to do this, uh, and uh, and there's so much good work to do. And and with those people who are feeling hopeless, it is helpful to talk about adaptation, because that is something they can do, and to get them to think about what they're passionate about and how they can protect that those things. So, we've got a lot of people who are really excited about you know this approach to looking at climate change and communicating about it. We're going to be sending out. Um, a link for the recording, but uh, got some questions about what other resources people might want to look at in addition to your YouTube. Yeah, well, I, I strongly urge you to, to listen to Citizens Climate Radio, not just because it's my podcast, um, but because um, it is really designed to help people be better climate communicators. In fact, every episode, there's a puzzler question which is not about science, but, but like, what do you say when somebody says this to you? And people call in and write in their answers. Uh, and so you get like real practice with this sort of thing. Uh, I would definitely encourage you to, um, to uh, see the episode uh, on Neo Noki, which I believe is episode 35. Listen to that episode. It is so incredibly helpful. Uh, it is a really useful resource. It's a 30 minute show, so it's not gonna take up your time. And I'm very, um, it's not rambly. I, 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 I'm a professional editor, and so it like has a nice, tight, almost like NPR kind of sound with music and, and all. Uh, and so it's it's well worth doing. Other great resources. I love um, the Yale Climate Connections. I'm sure some of you know about that. They're just they're this these very short 90 second, uh, and, and they're always about either something that somebody's doing about climate change to address it or uh, other, other types of solutions. So they're often, that's often really helpful stuff. And Noki itself uh, is a great site and with lots of resources. Uh, and so just do a search for N-N-O-C-C-I, or I'm sure that a link will go out to, to help you find that group. I've got a um, question that says, these, you know, barn dancing is church with a collar for dancing and free admission, but each person has to promise to do one new thing to help with the environment. So do you have any suggestions to help with the pledges that uh, people might make? Well, you know, I, I, I've been very controversial about this from the beginning. I get very um, frustrated with individual personal efforts to lower our personal carbon footprints in part because there's something dishonest about that. I think it gives people the sense like, if we all just do our part, we're gonna make a big difference. Look at the data, that is not true. So much of the polluting is happening outside of our households. And I think it's unfair that citizens should have to fix this problem and we're not able to. And so, yeah, I think it's, I think it's smart to lower, it's the moral thing to lower your carbon footprint. It's great practice when we're living in a world that has less fossil fuels and we have to learn how to, collect water or do what, I mean, these are all good things, but really the, the most powerful thing that we can do is to start, is to talk about this stuff, is to commit to talk about it, to, to post about it once a week on my social media, because lots of people aren't, still aren't talking about climate change, even people who are concerned about it, uh, and try to post things that are not gloom and doom and not angry mocking people, but if something is encouraging and hopeful for you, share that thing. And then similarly, regularly reach out to your member of Congress. I talk to members of Congress all the time and sometimes they say, yeah, this just doesn't come up that much. Uh, and in more conservative uh, districts in particular because people are very concerned about local issues. And so that comes up a lot. So tie climate change to a local issue and bring it to, the, to your lawmaker. And also bring about the positive impacts. If we work on climate change and we you know, get rid of fossil fuels, that means more local jobs because we need to retrofit all these homes for solar panels and all that. It's good for security, with being off the grid and having some locally sourced energy. I would say like kind of put it on your calendar once a month, send a note, an email to your member of Congress uh, and, uh, and, and so that they have a stockpile of that from you. <laughs> What would you say the and most happy? Educate yourself, obviously. Mm -hmm. okay. What would you say the most happy and hopeful visions of the future are that you share with your audience or talk with them about? To me, it's the ones like I, I remember doing one. I read well, like I love I love time travel, and so I loved uh, researching about the siege in Leningrad 
during World War II, which was a dire, horrible situation. And it was stunning to see how people rose to the occasions. And lots of people died. It was really difficult. But they created these um, like little units where people would just look after each other uh, and uh, they would just sort of check in with each other. So in one of my uh, That Day in Climate History, I had that sort of thing, that idea sort of revived where people had, um, whenever something happened, they had a, a group of people they were responsible to check in with. And the outcome was just people were less lonely, which, you know, this is, this is a reality. People are so lonely right now with all this internet and in, interconnectivity, people don't have actual FaceTime. And, um, and one of the benefits I think of even going through a disaster, that's a horrible thing is people end up getting closer to each other, looking out for each other. Uh, and I think for me, that was one of the, whenever it was one of those stories of people building community, finding community, that, that made me really happy because you don't need a lot of money or technology to do that. We are, uh, we actually have all the tools right here, right now to do that starting this moment. <laughs> Great. So I think we're running a low on time, but we could probably talk about this all night. So thank you so much. I'll turn this over. You're welcome. To I still have donuts. You didn't take all my donuts. So I, I might have to finish them myself. Just this chocolate one in particular is really calling to me. <laughs> I've already promised one of our commenters that I will buy him a donut the next time I see him in person. <laughs> Thank you so much, Peterson. That was really, really enjoyable. And it really touched my heart and my brain because I know I, for one, tend to stay focused on resolving a crisis rather than looking at the, the result of the resolution of crisis. And, um, and I think we all need to do that. And it's not um, all about hope, but it's about the reality that we will resolve the crisis and really focus on that sometimes, which we, um, I personally tend not to do. Um, and I know that I, I really should. Um, and I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned um, Lisa Van Susteren because she's going to be our guest speaker um, next month. Yeah. And so she it's a really you. nice follow up to you um, to hear her um, speak too. And I, I thank you for your humor, for your wisdom and for sharing um, your thoughts with us because I think it's been um, really, it, it really enlightening to see sort of transitions and really refocusing and reframing ourselves because we tend to focus on climate change and we're elders we're not scientists we don't talk really about science other than in a very rudimentary way where we talk about the passion of you know working towards preserving the planet for our grandchildren that's why i'm here that's why many of us are here um, and that's our our passion and we need to stay focused on that uh, <clears throat> and what the world will look like for them um, when they grow up so I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank you all uh, for being on the call tonight. It's been wonderful. Uh, you'll receive the recording uh, within the next couple of days. And I appreciate all of your, your time and energy. And please join us next month, uh, the fourth Tuesday of the month, same time, same station, for um, a conversation with Lisa Van Suster, um, who's going to be a great follow-up to, to Peterson. And I <clears throat> hope you all have a wonderful evening. And good night.